All right, looks like we're all back. <clears throat> this is lecture two, Ancient Sacrifices as Welcoming Gifts. So after sort of uh, rethinking our modern idea of sacrifice and comparing it to how ancient people thought and felt about sacrifice. Now we're going to get a little bit more specifically into the meaning of sacrifices for ancient people. <clears throat> there are clues to this in the Old Testament and how it describes sacrifices and the words that it uses, the metaphors, revolve around three images. One is food, the other is aroma, and then finally, gift. So sacrifice as food, aroma, and gift. <clears throat> so I've already mentioned this in the last lecture, but if we look at what the Bible allows people to offer as sacrifices, they're all food stuffs. Animals, of course, are the source of meat, uh, but there are other sacrifices allowed and called for by the Old Testament, um, which were not meat. They also are food, except for incense, which is a special category we'll talk about a little bit later on. But um, in Leviticus, there are sacrifices of wheat um, as flour, so, or semolina specifically, a certain kind of flour, which could be offered to God. Also baked goods, baked without yeast from that semolina, either fried in a pan or baked in an oven. It's very specifically described in Leviticus. There are three different methods of preparing uh, baked goods to offer as sacrifice. <clears throat> uh, and then there is this strange <clears throat> uh, category of milky seeds. In Leviticus uh, chapter 2, it says that milky seeds can be offered to God. Now, uh, that's often translated as barley uh, in English translations, uh, but there's reason to think that it actually refers to legumes, like chickpeas. In fact, that's how St. Cyril of Alexandria, writing in the 5th century, understands Leviticus's instructions there, that, it, that by milky seeds, it's referring to basically chickpeas. Now, the instruction for offering these milky seeds is that they must be roasted and ground and then bef before they're offered to the Lord. St. Cyril of Alexandria, in interpreting that instruction, has this to say, and this is the quote that's in front of you. The law has commanded that the offerings from legumes, chickpeas, must be crushed, that is ground precisely so that edibility, so to speak, might be shown to be characteristic of sacrifice. For we are accustomed to make food out of grain that has been broken into pieces, not the intact grain itself. He goes on to, uh, to say this is the, the case also with wheat. Wheat, according to Leviticus, cannot simply be offered as the raw grain but it first has to be ground and sifted in order to obtain semolina, which is the, which is the, the sort of coarser part of the, of the, of, of the flour and was, was considered to be more of a luxury item than the remaining uh, flour. So St. Cyril has this really key statement as a part of this interpretation. He says, edibility is characteristic of sacrifice. Edibility is characteristic of sacrifice. That edibility, being able to consume something as food, is part of the meaning 
of sacrifice, is essential to the meaning of sacrifice. And St. Cyril makes the point that the instructions in Leviticus for the preparation of sacrifices demonstrates this, that edibility is characteristic of sacrifice. So if we look at all of the sacrifices offered to God, each one of them, according to Leviticus, must be prepared into food before it is burnt on God's altar. So think about animal sacrifice. Now, here's a picture, a modern, very modern, cartoonish depiction of a sacrifice, a specific sacrifice from uh, the book of Judges. And this is the sacrifice of Manoah, Manoah, who I think was the father of Samson. I'm not sure. Or is that correct? Yeah, okay. So Manoah's wife meets a man who appears on their property one day and gives them this promise that Samson is going to be born. And she goes and gets her husband and brings her husband, and they're very impressed by this man that they've met. And so they want to welcome him into their home, you know, to show him hospitality. So Manoah says, wait here, and I'm going to go and prepare some food and bring it out for you. But the man says, no, if you're going to prepare some food, you should offer it as a sacrifice to the Lord. Offer it to the sacrifice, offer it as a sacrifice to the Lord. Uh, don't give it to me as food. And so Manoah goes in, he prepares the food, he brings it out and places it on, on an altar and uh, sets it alight as a sacrifice. And then as the flames and the smoke go up, the, the book of Judges tells us that the man, who is actually an angel, ascends into heaven uh, in the smoke. Now, if you look at this depiction just as a modern person, probably the thing that first caught your eye was the man flying up in the flames. You thought, wow, that's very strange. It's interesting, I think from the ancient perspective, that would not have been the most surprising thing in this picture. The most surprising thing would have been this dead goat carcass laying on the, uh, the altar, being burnt up. It's very strange that whoever illustrated this didn't read the book of Judges carefully because it says that Manoah, you know, uh, slaughtered the goat, cut it into pieces, boiled the meat, separated the meat from the juice. He brought the, 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 the juice from the meat in, in, a, in a pot and the, uh, the meat was separately in a basket and that's what was burned on the altar. Now, I think from, a, from sort of just our modern assumptions, we always have this vision of animals, you know, dead animals being thrown up on an altar or maybe even that the live animal was somehow wrestled onto the altar and they slid its throat on, on the altar because we think that the killing of the animal is the central feature of, of the sacrifice. But that's not how sacrifice is described in the book of Leviticus. Before uh, the offering is placed on the altar, the animal has to first be prepared as food. So what happens? They kill the animal, they skin the animal, they cut the animal into pieces. It's interesting, even in a Holborn offering where all of the meat is going onto the altar, they have to take the step of cutting it into pieces. Just like uh, a beef carcass is carved into pieces, into portions. So it has to be cut into pieces before placed on the altar. And then one final step, all sacrifices have to be sprinkled with salt. This highlights the fact that what's placed on the altar is not merely a dead animal, as in this picture, but prepared meat. Just like you would, you know, 
prepare a steak. Imagine if you were li living in old times and you prepared it literally from scratch. You would have to kill a, a cow, cut, you know, skin it, cut it up, and then season it with salt, and then throw it on the grill. Here they do all of that, but instead of throwing it on the grill, they throw it on the altar. Um, likewise, as I said, um, uh, olives cannot be offered whole as olives, picked off the tree and thrown on the altar. They have to be pressed, and the oil is used in sacrifice because oil is food, part of food, right? Um, grains have to be ground up uh, into flour, certain kinds of flour, uh, sprinkled with salt still, and usually they have oil poured over them. So imagine sort of like um, a, a, an unctuous starch, um, uh, flour with, with oil and salt mixed in. So sacrifice, sacrifices, sacrificial offerings are, um, are foodstuffs. Grapes are not thrown on the altar, but they have to be processed into wine. Every offering has to be processed into food before it can be offered to God. <clears throat> Additionally, <clears throat> um, the Old Testament gives instructions on combining offerings, uh, grouping offerings together. So whenever an animal sacrifice is made, it has to be accompanied by a specific amount of oil-soaked semolina and wine. The larger the animal, the more oil-soaked semolina and wine has to come with it. And this is all outlined in the book of Numbers. Uh, so when you brought an animal, you had to bring these companion offerings. Well, why is that? It means that when you offer meat to God on his altar, you also have to give him a starch and a beverage. It's a meal, right? Um, and W. Robertson Smith, uh, writing in the 19th century, observed this. He said, when the Hebrew ate flesh, he ate bread with it and drank wine. And when he offered flesh on the table of his God, the altar, it was natural that he should add to it the same accompaniments, concomitants, which were necessary to make up a comfortable and generous meal. So sacrifices weren't just food, they were a meal. And this meal was shared, as I mentioned before, but here you have the biblical references to back up what I said before. Um, when sacrifices were offered to God, they were often accompanied by feasting, and this is true in the Old Testament as well. Deuteronomy 12, verses 6 and 7. To the ten this is God speaking. Uh, actually, this is maybe Moses speaking in the name of God to the people. He says, To the temple you will bring your whole burnt offerings, sacrifices, first fruits, vows, and freewill offerings, and the firstborn of your cattle and sheep, and there you will eat in the presence of the Lord your God, and rejoice in everything your hand undertakes, you and your households, because the Lord your God blessed you. Now, reading this from a modern perspective, we might just sort of glaze over this and see two separate events, offerings and eating together. But they are joined together, right, in this command. And we have, uh, in, in the book, several different instances in the Old Testament where sacrifice is followed by meal, by a meal. Uh, and we'll see in terms of uh, the specific subset of Old Testament sacrifices called peace offerings, that these were the kinds of sacrifices that, for Jews, were followed by a meal. We'll talk more about that in the next lecture. But Moses foresees that the temple is a site not just for making offerings to God, but for 
the festal meal that follows the offering. Um, in Ezekiel, the prophecy of Ezekiel, there is a, a vision that Ezekiel has of a new temple that's going to be built. And it's described in detail. And one of the features of this new, new temple that he sees in his vision is dining rooms. That there were dining rooms in the temple so that once the offerer had made his offering to God, he could then take the leftovers there to have his feast with his family and friends. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 18, uh, St. Paul makes this statement, uh, actually a rhetorical question, are not those who eat the sacrifices partakers of the altar? This is in the context of his warning to uh, Christians about participating in the feast that followed a pagan sacrifice because he says, if you eat that food that, that was offered in pagan sacrifice, then you are joining yourself in fellowship with a pagan god who is actually a demon. Um, but when St. Paul states this, he actually connects it to not just pagan sacrifice, but he says this is true of Jewish sacrifice, of the Old Testament sacrifices, and it's also true of the uh, Christian sacrifice of the Eucharist. So I didn't give you the whole context there, but 1 Corinthians 10, verse 18, uh, you can take a look at that on your own, and that's where uh, St. Paul makes this uh, statement, gives this principle that sacrifice involves eating and partaking in fellowship uh, with the one to whom the sacrifice is offered. So, as food, as meals shared between God and man, sacrifices were symbolic hospitality offered to God and shared among his people. So the sacrificial offering, at least um, in, the, in the peace offering, we're going to talk about the, the different varieties, but in the peace offering, uh, sacrificial offerings become the, the they set the, the set the stage for a meal at which God is either the guest of honor in one sense, but also the host of the meal in another sense. Because the entire offering is given to God. So all the meat from the animal, all of the grain and baked goods and wine is handed over to God. But through his ritual instructions, God says, well, just take certain pieces of it, burn it on my altar, and give the rest back to the people. So this, this meal is given to God, but he gives most of it back to the people. Um, and then he's either the, the guest of honor or the host, and his, his priests partake of part of the meal, and, uh, and his people partake of the meal as well. And it is not any simple ordinary meal. According to the Old Testament law, the same ritual requirements um, that applied to worship in the te temple applied to partaking of this sacrificial meal, meaning you had to be in a state of ritual purity in order to eat the food, because eating the food was part of your act of worship. It wasn't just sort of like nutrition. And it wasn't just eating for pleasure. This was a meal of holy fellowship. You were receiving back food that had symbolically passed through the hands of God and was therefore filled with his grace, filled with his holiness. And you had to be prepared in order to partake of that. Hopefully you hear some resonances of the Eucharist there, <laughs> which are very much present. Before we go on to sacrifice as aroma, I'll pause for questions about sacrifice as food. Anybody? Okay. James? Um, I'm having uh, a little bit of trouble still understanding the difference between sacrifices and offerings. Hmm. And I'm still stuck in this idea that sacrifice is the giving up of something. Uh -huh. And that 
Yeah. In, in my mind, I'm still, I'm still seeing two different categories. Okay. One burning and yes. Gone. Yes. <laughs> One where, you know, hey, you got to have the different elements of a meal because we're going to eat that. Okay, yes. So, so we're struggling with the terms uh, sacrifice and offering, how they relate to one another, and if they are differentiated, uh, and how these rituals that I'm discussing uh, might be sort of distributed between these two terms if they are different. That's exactly it. Okay, good. I'm, I'm restating it for the sake of the, the video. Good. Very good. Um, so actually, those two terms are not different in the ancient context. And we'll just go back to etymology, which is something that I talk about in the book. But the word sacrifice itself comes from Latin, sacrificare, which literally means to make something sacred, to make something sacred. Uh, in, in the ancient sense, Latin, the Latin term um, uh, for sacred, um, and also the Greek term, um, Ayos, what this, what this term means is something, okay, something is sacred or holy because of its association to God or to a divine being. That's literally the definition of holy. We think of holy as, as a moral term, but its root meaning is um, something having to do with a God, something belonging to a God. So the, the, dif the distinction would be between Things are either sacred, meaning they are associated with God, or they're profane. Profane literally means that they aren't associated with God. They are of this world. Actually, the Greek word for holy, agios, probably comes from uh, not of this earth. Not of this earth. So something holy, something sacred is something that belongs to God and is therefore otherworldly, uh, not tied to this mundane existence that we're in. It's, it's differentiated because it belongs to God. So in the Old Testament, the temple is holy, uh, the sacrifices are holy because these are gifts that have been given to God. You make something holy by putting it in God's possession right? By dedicating it to him. It becomes holy by being dedicated to him. So really, anything offered to God is covered by that word sacrifice in, in its etymological sense. And that's what I got from the first lecture, for sure. Yes. And then I'm stuck with uh, trying to understand when is food destroyed in an offering versus yeah. just but, but I think. Yeah, so what is the difference? So, uh, so offering and sacrifice are really not different terms. Um, <clears throat> the distinction comes down to the meaning of, of the particular type of, of offering that's being made. Uh, and so really, even though the Latin term sacrificare could be applied etymologically speaking to any kind of offering to God. The Greek word, uh, theo, is the, is the verb, or uh, thema is the noun. The root is to turn to smoke. So etymologically in, in Greek, to sacrifice something means to turn it to smoke, which means that in that ritual, at least part of what's offered is burnt on the altar and turned into smoke. However, that turning into smoke, the point of it is not destruction. It's not getting rid of it. The point of it is that by turning it to smoke, you symbolically allow it to ascend to God who we think of as up there. This is all sort of symbolism um, it's, it's not even really that ancient people thought that the gods were sitting on clouds, you know, up there. But they are ontologically above us. And so by turning something to smoke, you turn it into this lighter form that is able to go to him. So really the point of turning to smoke is not to destroy it. The point is to make it available to God and to convey it to his 
uh, into his uh, possession and into his nostrils. We're actually getting to aroma. So part of the idea of turning to smoke is you're creating an aroma that goes to God. Um, so when we distinguish between certain sacrifices, everything is turned to smoke, or only part of it's turned to smoke, and part of it's given to the priests, and then maybe part of it's given to the people, it's not so much a distinction between destroying some and not destroying others, it's a distinction between who the recipients are and the proper way of delivering it to the recipients. Yes, so, um, so we will be talking about the blood as, uh, and its place in the overall ritual of sacrifice, the succession of steps that, that are involved in sacrifice in the next lecture. Uh, and so hopefully it will become clearer there. Um, and it's probably too much to go into right now. So, but, but um, just to go back to this idea of, of, of sacrifices as food, um, I didn't mention also there, literally, sacrifices are called food offerings. That's part of the terminology. Um, karpoma in Greek comes from karpos, which means fruit. So uh, it has an intimate connection to food. And then also uh, the Hebrew uh, or Greek word for bread or for food is used and applied to, to as a term for sacrifice as well. So, uh, yeah, so sacrifice as food is one of the sort of the keys to understanding biblical sacrifice. Um, yeah. There is something that several times I stumbled, and I listen to very carefully now, but uh, China reflects on that Jesus Oh, no, they did eat doves. Yeah. We eat chickens. We, we eat other game birds as well. So, no, these were, these were domesticated birds. Yep. Yeah. Sure, right, right, right. Did they do that time, or was there a significance to it to it? No, no, I think that though, it's even though we eat oil and olives, I mean, we eat olives and grapes, um, that the effort put into preparing it makes it better, in a sense, right? So oil um, is richer than just eating olives. And wine, of course, is richer is a richer form of food than than grapes. So part of it is that effort, and think about it in terms of hospitality, right? So if we're talking about we're offering food to God, uh, when we offer food to people, the more effort we put into it, the more meaning it has. So so that's part of it as well. Okay. All right. So sacrifice as aroma. This is another metaphor that the Old Testament uses to describe the significance of sacrifice. Here's an example, Genesis 8, 21. The Lord God, this is, okay, just to give you context, this is uh, Noah's sacrifice after coming out of the ark. So Noah exits the ark, and he offers after the flood has destroyed everything, but he's been spared by God's mercy. And so as a way of showing gratitude to God, he offers sacrifice. And then verse 21, the Lord God smelled a pleasant aroma. 
And the Lord God thought, I will not again curse the ground on account of the works of men, although the thought of man is completely devoted to evil from youth. Therefore, I will not again strike all flesh that lives as I did. So there's this sense that when the sacrifice is burned, a, a, a pleasing aroma goes up to God. He smells it. And this is anthropomorphizing a little bit putting it in human terms we can understand but he smells this smell and he's like oh okay I'm not going to destroy you again you know like so it seems to change his mind now theologically we'd say that's not actually what happened this is a way of describing um, how this ritual affects God because God doesn't have a nose uh, until the incarnation, of course. But uh, here at the time of Noah, God doesn't have a nose. Uh, and certainly, smells aren't enough to change his mind. <laughs> but this idea of a pleasant aroma is repeated throughout Leviticus and Numbers in the sacrificial instructions. It says over and over again that the priest shall offer this as a pleasant aroma for, for your God. He shall offer this as a pleasant aroma for your God, as a pleasant aroma for your God, over and over again. Leviticus and Numbers are very repetitive. But that repetition drives home um, the importance of, of this sort of symbolism. Numbers 28, verse 1 and 2, this is a quote that combines those, those ideas of um, food offering and aroma. Uh, now the Lord said to Moses, command the sons of Israel and say to them, my gifts, my presents, my food offerings, you will continue to bring me as a pleasant aroma on my feasts. Also brings in the idea of gifts, which we'll go to. So this really sums it all up. By the way, when you look at your um, translation of, of Numbers 28, verse 2, you're going to say, Father Jeremy, you're trying to trick us because what I translate my food offerings, it will almost certainly translate uh, my burnt offerings, my offerings by fire. Uh, but this is actually a, a mistranslation of the Hebrew term. And Jacob Milgram explains it quite articulately in his scholarly um, commentary of 2,000 pages on the book of Leviticus. But um, in, in Hebrew, this term, which is usually translated uh, offering by fire, uh, that's a, he, he shows that that's a mistranslation, that it has to do with offerings by food. And, and that understanding of the Hebrew word actually fits in better, as I said, with the Greek term that's used in the Septuagint, our Greek version of the Old Testament, uh, karpoma which, as I said, is related to karpos, and it is a term that is intimately related, therefore, to food, to the idea of food offerings. So that's where that translation comes from. <clears throat> the modern biblical scholar, Jonathan Clawins, uh, he, he talks about this um, aroma aspect of sacrifice. He says, sacrifice attracts and maintains the divine presence. The purpose is to provide regular and constant pleasing odors to the Lord so that the divine presence will continually remain in the sanctuary. So this idea of a pleasing aroma is also intimately connected with attracting God's attention, attracting his presence. In um, pagan Greek texts, there's this term knisa, which is a term specifically for the smell of roasting meat. And it is often, like in Homer's uh, epics, uh, connected with sacrifice, that sacrifices produce this knisa, the smell of roasting meat. And in, in actually in, in Greek uh, comedies, Greek, Greek plays, um, it's often a... Um, seen as, as something that doesn't just attract the gods, but attracts other people. So when you offer sacrifice, you know, there are people who are always sniffing around for a good sacrifice so that they can come and share, right? And so it attracts a crowd of uh, hungry people. 
Um, so this, this idea of the Knisa, which attracts other people, but also attracts the attention of, of the gods in pagan sense, or um, in, the, the, in the Old Testament, the attention of God. Um, in this, this is where, this, this sense of aroma is where incense can be understand as, understood as sacrifice as well. Because incense, of course, creates a pleasant aroma, an attractive and inviting scent. Um, there were instructions in the Old Testament that the tabernacle, later the temple, had to be filled with incense. There was an incense offering uh, on the special golden altar inside of the tent or the temple. Um, and incense had to be offered there regularly, morning and evening, so that that room would be filled, God's house would be filled with this beautiful scent in order to attract his attention. So you'd have the smell of incense, you'd have the smell constantly of roasting meat and also of baked goods, you know, because you're throwing oily flour onto the, onto the fire. Um, and so this, this beautiful, attractive scent is constantly uh, going up to attract God's presence. Now, I didn't include this quote because I didn't think of it, but there is um, a statement at the end of Leviticus where God warns the people that if they rebel against him and if they sin against him and they don't keep his laws, he says, among other things, I will no longer smell your sacrifices. So uh, this is one of the points where the Old Testament is differentiating itself from the pagan sacrifices that are going around, going on around, because the, the pagan sacrifices were this idea of almost tricking the gods, like manipulating the gods, like the gods uh, are always sniffing around who's offering the best sacrifice, and if we can offer them the best sacrifice, then they'll help us out, you know? But here God says, no, the point is, if you're obeying me, I'm going to smell your sacrifices. If you're not obeying me, I don't care about your sacrifices. This is important to file away. We're going to be talking about this later when we talk about Old Testament sacrifices and why they eventually uh, proved insufficient. Any questions about... Oh, so by the way, just as a modern metaphor, um, this idea of sacrifices of Rome is similar to the way that we try to attract other people through pleasant aromas. Think about colognes and perfumes and scented candles in your home. Like if you're inviting a guest into your home, you try to make your home smell good, right? Uh, so even today, we use scent as a way of inviting people into our lives. Just as we also use food hospitality as a way of inviting people into our lives. All right, hold on to that. Uh, any questions before we go on to gifts? So our view of uh, Christian traditions that don't use incense. <clears throat> well, I don't know that we would say that that sort of invalid, completely invalidates their worship. It's, uh, again, it's not that the material offerings are essential, and we'll talk about that more when we talk about Old Testament sacrifices and why they failed. The material offerings themselves do not, not, do not necessarily produce the desired result. There has to be more, and the more, the internal work, is the essential part. But, you know, for us, our use of incense in church connects us to this ancient idea and maybe helps us to understand better uh, what, what was going on in the Old Testament. And, and um, if, we, if, we, if we understand that relational dynamic of scent, it helps us to see that what we're doing in the church is trying to uh, attract God into our lives, which, which you know, so the, these material things, um, Help to keep us help help to keep us aware of, of the spiritual work that we're that we're doing. Yeah, that, that answer your question is a yeah. little bit ram, rambling. Sorry. Yeah. 
Oh, I wish I could get to the sacrifice of, of, of uh, Isaac. I don't know if we'll have time. I definitely treat that in the book. Um, I have half a chapter devoted to that, but um, I will, if, if I have time, maybe when we're talking about the Old Testament sacrifices. We'll talk about that as well. Um, going back to what you said about uh, Jerusalem and Ezekiel when they're talking about the new temple. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm thinking what I understand of the Old Testament temple is that most people didn't actually go in, right? So the man of the house would bring the sacrifice, give it to the priest, they would sacrifice it, bring the meat back out. So the eating happens outside. So. Well, okay, so the question is about where are these dining rooms because the temple was a restricted area. So, we, the, so when we say temple, oftentimes we think of the building, the house of God, which was divided into the holy place and the holy of holies. But the temple complex included courtyards and also the tabernacle included the courtyard. So there was the tent itself in the tabernacle, the mobile worship site before the temple. There was the tent, which was like the house of God, uh, and the holy place, which was like God's living room, and the holy of holies, which was like his bedroom. So the most intimate point. And the holy of holies was so restricted that only the high priest could go there once a year, and very carefully. And the holy place, the living room of God, was still pretty important and only priests could go there. Nobody could go there except for the priests and they had to be prepared in certain ways, washing and stuff like that before they could go in. But the courtyard, which was still part of the tabernacle, though not of the tent, but it was an open air courtyard around the tabernacle, which was fenced off from the, from the community, that was open to people coming in as long as they were prepared, like ritually prepared. So they had to be ritually clean. They couldn't have been defiled by any of the various things that uh, prevented them from entering the, the tabernacle. So there was a courtyard even in the tabernacle where the people could come in. In the temple, it, became, it all became more elaborate. So there were multiple courtyards and these courtyards were not fenced off by curtains like the tabernacle but by walls and buildings, actually. So there was, were open-air parts, but then there were buildings like with rooms in them. So these dining rooms would be part of the courtyard, uh, not part of the, the temple itself. So this is not connected to what we do in the Eucharist, where we're all eating right here in the nave. Uh, Right, yeah, so, yeah, so we're, you know, the temple, the veil has been torn and we're ushered into the presence of God, so those kind of restrictions are taken away, the, the division uh, that, that keeps, keeps us from the most intimate encounter with God. Yeah. Okay, now this is, this is actually the, the biggest one, so I'm going to try to be brief, but I want you to... Uh, to have a chance to, to grasp it. So sacrifices as gifts. Sacrifices as uh, were uh, one particular example of a general cultural phenomenon across ancient cultures, which is the idea of ceremonial friend-making gifts. <clears throat> now we have sort of the relics of that today where we often use gifts as a way of building relationships. Think about birthdays. When we celebrate birthdays of loved ones, we bring them gifts, and those gifts are a way of building relationships, or friends, and friends or family. Um, also, uh, other holidays like Christmas would be another example where we give gifts to friends and family as a way of building relationships with them. There are also um, other occasions like think about an engagement ring. That's actually a gift to build a relationship, right? And that's really closely related to what we're talking about here in terms of ceremonial friend-making gifts because it's literally connected to an invitation to a relationship, right? 
This gift, a very valuable gift, is offered um, as a way of asking, will you marry me? And then if the answer is yes, the gift is accepted and kept as a representation of that accepted relationship, right? If she doesn't want to marry him, then she says, no, thank you, and he can keep the ring, right? So here we have a very specific example of a, of a relationship-producing gift. Um, we also just do this in so many, like, informal ways. Um, uh, and then in other formal ways, too. Like, so think, think about the leaders of countries. When they go to visit each other, they often bring gifts. And those gifts often represent their people. And maybe it's not even as... It's not really about um, the monetary value of the gift because, of course, these are people who oversee budgets of billions and trillions of dollars. So if they, you know, if, if uh, the <coughs> Prime Minister of Canada gives the American president, um, you know, a jar of maple syrup, he's, uh, he doesn't really need that. But what it is, it's, it's symbolic because it represents the giver right? Giving something that represents himself, and when that's ac accepted, it symbolically represents accepting the other person, right? So the gift has meaning because it represents the person. So these are all sort of relics of what was a much more pervasive and systematic and formal reality in ancient cultures. All kinds of relationships in ancient cultures, and we see this, you know, uh, historians have, have brought this to the fore. All kinds of relationships in ancient cultures were begun and continued through the exchange of gifts. It was just sort of assumed that if you wanted to make a new friend, one of the very first things that you would do is offer them a gift. And when you offer them that gift, it's an offer of yourself. And it's not sort of like, you know, you pull out 50 bucks and say, here, will you be my friend? It's not about sort of buying a friend. But you choose something that comes from you, that something that you have sort of invested in and that represents you, and that is desirable to the other person, and you offer that to them, and that outstretched hand with the gift represents, I want to be your friend. I want to be in relationship with you. And if that person wanted to accept the relationship, they would accept the gift. And by accepting the gift, they would commit themselves to that offered relationship. And then, in turn, at some later point, if they wanted to continue the relationship, they would offer... Another, they would offer sort of a reciprocal gift, their own gift. So the person A gives a gift to person B to start the relationship, and then at some later point, person B will give his own gift, some other gift that represents him and is desirable to the other person. He would give that gift as a sign of, I really am enjoying this relationship, let's continue. And that would go on throughout the relationship, back and forth, not again as a sort of means of exchange, not as sort of like, you know, a, a commercial bargain, but as a way of symbolically giving yourself and pledging yourself and committing yourself to that relationship. Uh, the French philosopher, I'm gonna butcher it, Marcel Enoff, <clears throat> uh, has written an essay, a beautiful essay, about how ceremonial gift-giving works in these uh, traditional cultures. Uh, first quote, ceremonial friend-making gifts are a procedure that consists of committing oneself by giving something of oneself as a token of and substitute for oneself. So he's just really describing that dynamic of that you're giving not just something that's materially valuable, but something that symbolically represents yourself. And by giving that thing that represents yourself, you're symbolically giving yourself to the other person. Okay? 
The next quote, uh, the gift is a thing that comes from oneself, stands for oneself, and bears witness to the commitment that was made. Think about that in terms of the engagement ring, right? As long as she's wearing the engagement ring, it reminds her of this relationship that was offered by her fiance and accepted by her, right? So the gift becomes a witness or a symbol of the commitment that was made and accepted. And then finally, what is, or third, what is given through the thing given is always oneself. So the point of the gift is that you are giving yourself to the other person. Uh, and then finally, about that reciprocity, that ongoing exchange back and forth of, of um, successive gifts. <clears throat> that the gift is a conception of reciprocity that not only has nothing to do with the notion of self-interest, it's not just a commercial bargain, you know, where I'm trying to get the better of you, I'm trying to get what you have for the least, and giving the least of what I have for, for the most of what you have. So it has nothing to do with the notion of self-interest, but also defines the very core of human relationships. Um, so, a really key idea, just in general in terms of cultures, but as I said, sacrificial offerings were one specific example of that wider cultural paradigm. This is reflected in, um, some, in, in a fact that is so common in the Old Testament that we might just, it might just completely breeze past it, past us. Um, in the Old Testament, over and over again, the main term for Hebrew sacrifices is gifts. When you read in Leviticus that someone, you know, the instructions for offering a sacrifice, what it actually says is when a man brings his gift to the Lord, the gift that he will bring is this. And it says gift over and over again in um, in Greek, the word is very clearly gift. In Hebrew, the word is actually a little bit more specific uh, and refers to a present brought when approaching someone, which is that whole idea of, of the gift offered as an invitation to a new relationship, a means of approach, the gift as a means of approach, relationally speaking. Now, as I said, the gifts have to represent the giver, and they also have to be um, desirable to the recipient. Um, so, in terms of Old Testament sacrifice, uh, the law prescribes very carefully what can be given. And those requirements are so that the gift will symbolize the things that God wants from us. All right? That's the reason for the restrictiveness and the specificity in the law about what sacrifices should, should be offered. And, on the other side, what kinds of things are not acceptable as sacrifice. So what are, and specifically we'll talk, well, what are the things that, that can be offered as sacrifice in the Old Testament? <clears throat> certain animals, we'll talk a little bit about that now. Um, certain kinds of produce, uh, so that would be those, those grain offerings, as well as oil and wine. All of these are agricultural products. Um, it's interesting that hunted meat, hunted game, could not be offered as sacrifice under the old law. We'll talk a little bit later maybe about why that is. But they had to be domesticated animals or domesticated produce. You also couldn't go and pick wild berries from the forest and offer them to God. Like these are things that human beings tend and cultivate. They put effort into it, right? Um, 
Now, specifically about animals, there are only there are specific kinds of animals that can be offered. Cattle, sheep, goats, turtle doves, pigeons. Those are the only animals that can be offered. And these animals represent certain qualities. Um, first of all, they're all tame animals. They're domesticated animals. This is one of the reasons why hunted animals are not allowed. These are animals that represent, therefore, obedience. Okay? They're symbolic of obedience. Because they, these animals are obedient to their human masters. They also are all herbivores. None of them are carnivores. So they don't eat other animals. This is a key part of their symbolism as well. They're harmless towards their fellow animals. These are all animals also that provide benefits to the human race. So they're fruitful. Fruitfulness is another quality that they, that they all reflect. And then finally, um, there's a requirement that whatever animal is offered to the Lord has to be without blemish or free from defect. And so the animals that are offered uh, so not any, it's, uh, it's not any cat, cow can be offered, not any sheep can be offered, but the cow that's offered has to be free from defect, free from any blemish or injury, uh, or even one leg longer than the other. They have to be s symmetrical and whole and, um, uh, and uh, beautiful in the, f the form of, of their animal. Like they should be a proper, proper looking uh, and acting animal. Okay. Philo of Alexandria makes a point of these, uh, especially these first three qualities and how they apply to all the animals offered. <clears throat> so really just illustrating what I've just told you. He says, the pigeon is the most gentle and domesticated and gregarious of birds. By the way, Philo of Alexandria was a Jewish philosopher uh, who lived at around the time of Christ. And he maybe didn't know of Christ because he was in Alexandria, Egypt. He probably didn't know about Christ. Um, but his interpretations of the Old Testament actually are, are very interesting for showing us how ancient Jews understood these rituals. So, the pigeon is the most gentle and domesticated and gregarious of birds, uh, and the dove is the most tame of those that are solitary. Cattle, sheep, and goats, he kind of overstates the point, are gentle and manageable in the highest degree. At any rate, great herds of cattle and flocks of sheep and goats are driven by anyone at all, not only by a man, but even by a very small child. Now, I don't know if I would entrust a very small child to drive a great herd of cattle, but his point is well taken. Um, he goes on, they are all herbivores and not one of them is carnivorous. And finally, moreover, they are the most useful of animals for human needs, rams for clothing, oxen for tilling the earth, preparing it for sowing and threshing the resultant produce for use and enjoyment as food. And the hair and hides of goats woven and sewn together make portable dwellings for travelers and especially soldiers. So here Philo, the ancient Jewish commentator, um, recognizes the symbolic qualities of uh, the, the Old Testament sacrifices which were allowed. Um, also, as I said, the gifts have to be unblemished, but the giver has to be unblemished too. And this is where that idea of ritual purity comes from. Um, We'll talk about that in a second. Uh, but first, this quote from Philo about the gift, the animal having to be unblemished or perfect, as he said. All the animals must be perfect, injured in no part of the body, absolutely without wound and free of blemishes. And then he gives the reason. Why, why do they have to be without blemish? He says, for through symbols, the law intends to instruct the offerers whenever they approach the altars whether performing vows or giving thanks, not to bring with them any infirmity, disease, or passion of the soul, but to try to sanctify 
a completely spotless soul so that God might not turn away when he sees. There's a note there, I, I added a note, that the word sanctify there, by that he probably means sacrifice. And this goes back to my answer to the earlier question about what the word sacrifice means. Sacrifice means to make holy. And in the sense of these rituals, it means to put something into the uh, holy pr uh, possession of God. You make something holy by giving it to God, by putting it in his possession, by transferring it to the divine realm. And so the word sanctify, actually, in the Old Testament, the word sanctify or make holy, is actually a synonym for the word sacrifice. And here, Philo makes the point that the qualities of the animal represent the qualities, the, the physical qualities of the animal represent the spiritual qualities that the offerer is pledging to God. So when the offerer approaches with his perfect animal, he gives it to God as a, as a representation of him giving his soul in an unblemished manner to God. So the fact that his animal offering has no defects is supposed to represent that his soul is going to be free from defects in relationship to God. Likewise, the animal being obedient harmless and fruitful represents the offerer's intention and commitment to be obedient towards God, to be um, harmless towards his fellow man, and instead to be fruitful and beneficial, helping to provide for the needs of his fellow man. So these offerings therefore symbolize physically all the qualities that God asks from his people spiritually, right? So giving these gifts represents a commitment to give ourselves to God in the same way by adopting these same qualities and incorporating these same qualities into our lives in a spiritual sense, okay? Whew. Now, the, the blood, the blood, what place does the blood have in this symbolism? Thankfully, God explains, at least to a certain degree, what place the blood has in these offerings. Leviticus 17, 11. This is the Lord speaking. The soul of all flesh is its blood. And I myself have given it to you to make atonement upon the altar for your souls, for its blood makes atonement in place of the soul. Now, the actual word in Leviticus is soul. Often you'll see this translated as life, which is not wrong because we have to understand what the word soul means in a biblical sense. In Greek, it's psyche, which was where the word psychology comes from. Uh, so what was understood as a soul in, the, in, in Greek philosophy and sort of in the ancient mentality generally, um, soul was life force. It was the energy of living things. And there were sort of different levels of soul. So Greek philosophers said that plants have souls, but they have the plant kind of soul. And so the plant soul is sort of the lowest, simplest form of a soul. It's the energy that causes it to grow, right? That's what makes it different from a rock. The rock doesn't have that soul, because the rock doesn't grow. But uh, a plant has this energy to grow, and that's life force. Life force, yes, the life force to grow. Um, animals also have souls. 
And animals, Greek philosophers would say, they have the plant soul, but then on top of that, they have an improvement, which is the fact that they sort of, in a, on a simple level, make choices. And they have instinct that drives them. Um, and so they have, and they seem to have, you know, we recognize in, in animals, they seem to have some level of personality, right? Uh, and so that's sort of the animal soul, but then humans have the rational soul or the logikos psyche, the, the uh, logical or rational soul, which involves our ability to understand and to make sense of the world through thought. Um, so these are the different levels of soul and the, the type of life force that a being has, um, you know, so reflects what the being is. So, if we say that the soul of all flesh is its blood, that's sort of like really just uh, a thought that a symbolism that could derive just from the from 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 experience. Because what happens when you empty an animal of its blood? It's dead. It's no longer living. So the animal is only living as long as the blood is circulating through the body. So it's very understandable to see that that is the life force of the animal. The blood uh, is what keeps the animal living. But it's more than that. In the ancient perspective, the blood is also the energy of how it lives. And it's sort of imbued with the character and identity of the being. Uh, and we see this reflected in, I hate to use the word, primitive cultures, like traditional cultures, where, uh, you know, throughout the world, you know, indigenous cultures, where uh, in different ones, um, there might be rituals of drinking blood or of eating the heart of your, the, the animal that you killed or something like that where there's a symbolism attached to it of trying to draw the life force, the energy of that being into yourself. So if I want to be as strong as a bear, I'm going to drink the blood of a bear and that's gonna make me as strong as a bear. But I'm, what I'm mentioning that is that it, it shows like that, that, that ancient sort of association, mental association, symbolic association between the way the animal lives and its blood as sort of the energy of the animal living in that way. So the, so the Lord says that he's given blood, the animal blood, as a means of making atonement on the altar for the sake of the human soul. So the animal soul makes atonement for the sake of the human soul because the animal soul becomes a representation of the human soul. Okay? Um, so, go back to those qualities of the animal. The animal's life, those particular animals that can be offered, their lives represent obedience, they, they demonstrate obedience, harmlessness, and fruitfulness, and they physically are unblemished. That represents their physical life. Animals' life, uh, animals' lives are on the physical plane. And so the qualities of their soul are those things. Obedience, harmlessness, fruitfulness, and in the case of these particular animals that could be offered, uh, lack of defect. Um, the animal, before it's killed, has to be brought into the presence of the Lord and shown to the Lord. This is an important detail. So we kind of we kind of like rush past all of these preliminary steps. But when the animal is shown to the Lord, what are you doing? You're showing this is the kind of animal that this blood is coming from. You're associating the qualities of the animal with the blood that's going to be taken from the animal. All right, by showing it to the Lord and then slitting its throat uh, before the Lord. Now, why do you split, sl slit its throat? 
Not because you're like being sort of hor horrid and gruesome and argh, slitting something, through, but it, there's a practical reason. That's so that all of the blood can be collected. So there's a priest who's standing by so that every drop of blood, so to speak, can be collected to be offered to God. Because that blood is so richly symbolic, it's imbued with those qualities on a physical level, which are going to then represent the qualities being pledged on a spiritual level by the offerer. Uh, also, before the animal is, uh, before its throat is slit, the offerer has to stand beside the animal and put his hand on its head and press its head down. It actually says it has to, he has to press his head. It's not just sort of like laying it lightly on the animal. He has to sort of apply force to it. In Hebrew, it's very specific. He, he presses down on the head of the animal, showing that this is my animal. This is an animal that belongs to me and that represents me. And immediately after that act, the blood is taken from the animal. And then immediately it's taken to the altar and applied to the altar uh, in, in certain ways. I don't have time to go into all of them, but it's in some way, in a certain way, based on the type of offering being made, applied to the altar, usually splashed all around the altar. The blood is taken with the bowl and splashed onto the walls of the altar and it has to go all the way around the altar. And this is done before the meat and other food offerings are placed on the altar. So it's obviously a preparation for the food offering. You're right, it comes before the food offering. It's also a transitional element between the presentation of the animal, the association of the offerer with the animal, and the offering of that meal, that symbolic meal to God. So my understanding of the blood being offered is that it conveys that symbolism of the animal's qualities and applies it to the meal that's being given to God. So the table is the table, the altar, which is God's table. It's actually called God's table in the Old Testament. It is prepared by being painted with this richly symbolic blood in order to show that I'm offering you this meal which represents my commitment to you, God, to be obedient, harmless, and fruitful, and free of defect, free of spiritual defect. Okay? It's a lot, I know. So, the sacrifices as a whole were symbolic pledges to show those qualities that the, uh, that the gifts represented. We're focusing on the animal gifts, but uh, the uh, non-animal gifts had similar, um, though less sophisticated, uh, symbolism. Sacrifices were symbolic pledges to show these same qualities in relationship to God. And now I'll take your questions. I'm sure you have questions. Yes. Just to ensure that you can come back again, I'll ask you what atonement means. Atonement, yes. <laughs> atonement is an English word <clears throat> which is actually a compound word that reflects the phrase at one. So atonement, the word atone, is simply putting the words at one together. That's how that word was uh, formed. So when you atone, you um, reconcile. You bring, you reconcile specifically God and a human being. So atonement is reconciliation of man to God making them at one, bringing them back together um, after sin had separated them. So that's what the word atonement means. Now atonement, 
is used to translate Greek and Hebrew words which don't exactly mean atonement. They don't exactly mean reconciliation, but they're related to the idea of reconciliation. In Greek, or let's start with Hebrew. In Hebrew, the word is, I'm not going to pronounce it right, nephesh. Uh, no, it's not. Uh, begins with a K. Kipper, 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 kipper. Uh, nephesh is soul. Kipper, um, kipper is a hard word to translate because it is only used in ritual contexts. And so there's not like a variety of usages in order to triangulate its meaning. Uh, so really, it, it, has, it came to mean in biblical Hebrew, the effect of sacrifice. But if we look into the etymology and like related words in other Semitic languages, kaper um, probably means removal. Removal. There's a, a point. There, there was a point in scholarship where it was understood to mean cover, like sacrifices covered a sin or hid hid the sin from God's view. But it, now the consensus is that it means remove, like it removes sacrifice removes any um, anything that's disrupting the divine human relationship. So. The word kaper is translated atonement. It, re, it removes, it, which atonement doesn't reflect the specific meaning, but it reflects the effect of kaper. So kaper by removing whatever is disrupting the divine human relationship brings humanity back into oneness with God. Okay? The Greek word... Um, I don't even know if we have time to go in the Greek word, but the Greek word has another slightly different meaning, but it all has to do with, atonement has to do with resolving the problem of sin which keeps us from intimacy with God. So that's what, it, that's what atonement means. It is in place of you, but it's in place of you in a specific way, not in the way uh, that commonly is, is uh, used in penal substitution atonement uh, or substitutionary atonement. Uh, it's, in place, uh, it's used in place of one in that sense of gift. Remember, let's see, let's go back to that quote. A thing that comes one, from oneself stands for oneself and bears witness to the commitment that was made. So it's not that the animal is killed so that you don't have to die, which is the other way of understanding it as a substitution. But it's a substitution as a symbol, a symbolic pledge specifically, a symbol of you giving yourself to God. So when you give this gift to God, it symbolizes you giving yourself to God, and in that way it's a substitute for you. It's a token, a token of, uh, of, that, of that pledge or commitment. Okay, to have your soul sinless in order to make an offering. So I didn't actually thank you for reminding me because I didn't explain what it meant when I said the giver and the gift must be unblemished. The, the, the law required that the giver um, prepare himself and, and make sure that he was ritually clean before he came. But that's not, ritually clean is not the same as being sinless. So ritually clean meant that you had to avoid contact with certain things which were physically, ritually defi defiling. Basically, 
anything that was dead, like a dead body, uh, a dead animal, um, you ha or uh, anything that was related to sex, um, or uh, certain kinds of food, that, that you had to avoid these things, or if you couldn't avoid them, you had to go through a process of sort of symbolically distancing yourself from them. Meaning, um, like for example, if you touched a dead body, you had to wait for a specific period of time and then maybe wash yourself with water or be sprinkled with uh, something to symbolically show that, look, I'm separating myself from this. The reason for that was not that those things are bad. Uh, sex, dead and f sex, death, and, f and food are not evil in and of themselves. But those are things of this world. Remember we talked about sacred versus profane? Those are profane things because they don't have to do with the life of God. So God does, there's no death in God. There's no sex in God. There's no food in God. God doesn't need food. When a person made the effort to abstain from these things, it was a way of symbolically showing that he wanted to participate in God's life rather than being just stuck in merely human life. So it was, it was sort of aspirational. Um, so no, you didn't have to be sinless. Now you had to be repentant. So you had to recognize that what you did was wrong and be, be uh, uh, committing yourself to not do it in the future. Now, not all offerings were sin offerings, so there were other offerings that had nothing to do with sin, and we'll talk about that more later on. Or didn't directly have to do with sin. So then would that be comparable to what we do today in terms of like preparation for holy Yeah, exactly. Fasting and uh, saying the prayers and going to confession, all of those things are, are really analogous to that preparation the pers person had to physically or symbolically undergo before bringing sacrifice to God. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sheep, goats, turtle doves. It's interesting, maybe you have some insight on this. It's interesting that, you know, the forerunner says, Behold the lamb who takes away the sins of the world. Yeah. Why isn't it behold the cattle or behold the turtle doves? Or yeah. Well, why why sh the lamb specifically? Um So the lamb if, if you, you, know, you think about all of these animals, as I said, they are all obedient and tame. But the lamb is the most tame. Like, as meek as a lamb, we say. Because the, the lamb, and not just a sheep, right? A lamb is specifically a young sheep. Um, and so it's maybe, it's sort of like it's the foremost example. And also we think of lambs as being very pure. You think of like a pure white lamb, gentle and pure and innocent and naive. And so the, like the, the lamb sort of is maybe the, the uh, most, it's, it's the summit of all of those qualities. Yeah. Precisely, yeah. So, so it emphasizes that Christ is the, the ultimate sacrifice. Yes, yes. Oh, I'm not going to be able to talk about it later, I don't think, but um, it's in the book. But, but just to say briefly, so, he's, so Father asked about the Passover sacrifice, where the animal's blood was painted onto the doors, uh, which is different from other sacrifices where it was painted onto the altar, but it actually is this, has the same basic kind of meaning. So... If, if you take what I said about the blood on the altar and you apply it to the blood on the doorpost, what it does is it represents that this house contains people who are committing themselves to obedience towards God, harmlessness towards their fellow man. So basically, be, be, you know, following God's law. 
This is, these are people who are, committed them, who are committing themselves spiritually to, father, to follow God's law, to show the qualities of the lamb in their own lives. So instead of imbuing the altar and the meal being offered on it with that meaning, they are um, identifying their household and everyone inside of the house as being defined by those symbolic qualities. Yeah. Yeah, that gets into what I said I didn't have enough time to talk about, but the Greek word, the Greek word for atonement is elaskome or exelaskome, that's the verb. And in non-biblical Greek, it means propitiation. So, in non-biblical Greek like uh in pagan writings, um when they talk about offering sacrifices to their gods, they offer them as propitiation. And that verb takes as its object God or Zeus or Hera or whatever. So for pagan Greeks, they propitiated their gods, meaning they tried to make their gods favorable towards them. And that's what it meant in non-biblical Greek. Uh, when in 250 BC, when the um, Jewish translators translated the Hebrew Bible into Greek, the Septuagint translation, uh, they used the word exilaskome or elaskome for uh, kaper. But it, they were sort of like shoehorning a Hebrew concept into Greek language. And um, appropriating, we, we would say appropriating this Greek word to mean something that it didn't mean exactly, mean like so, sort of like a different nuance than it meant in pagan uh, usage. And we can see that this is the case because in biblical Greek, Elaskome and exilaskome do not take God or the Lord as their object. You're not propitiating the Lord. The object of those verbs is always, if it has an object, sin. So it's, it would be absurd to say that I'm going to propitiate sin. <laughs> like I'm going to try to make sin more favorable to, toward me. I'm trying to win sin over. That's what propitiate means, and that it's absurd. So what the Septuagint translators were doing were saying that, look, this is the effect of sacrifice that we're seeking, but the effect is different from what you pagans say. This is something that's being done to sin. We're, we're still restoring the relationship, but we're not restoring the relationship by trying to manipulate the gods. We're restoring the relationship by removing our sin, which is what... Uh, disrupts the relationship. Does that make sense? Okay. How often would these, um, sacrifices they were happening all the time. So there was a whole uh, calendar of sacrifices. Every day, sacrifice had to be offered at the temple in the morning and in the evening for the sake of all the people. Um, every Saturday, there were extra, extra sacrifices for the Sabbath. Every new moon, so each month at the new moon, there were special sacrifices. Every year, there were certain sacrifices, in addition to the daily sacrifices. Uh, and so there was this whole complex calendar of offerings that was offered just on a regular basis, um, you know, every 12 hours, basically. In addition to that, people would bring sacrifices for their own personal reasons. And this is where, you know, like if I committed a sin and I wanted to reconcile to God, I would bring a sacrifice. Or 
if God did something great for me and I wanted to show him gratitude, I would bring a sacrifice. So in addition to those standard regular sacrifices that were just going on according to the calendar, there were people every day bringing their own sacrifices for their own reasons. So it was just constant, uh, constantly going on. We may, but I do draw a distinction because, so when we talk about Christ and his saving work, there are different dimensions of that. Sacrifice is one dimension, but another dimension is ransom. And sacrifice and ransom are different things. And so we have to make, have to be clear, you know, uh, like it's like looking at the cross from different points of view. So the cross is a sacrifice, the cross is a ransom, the cross is... Uh, a, a teaching model. It shows us how to live. The cross is um, a, uh, the way that Christ defeated death. That's different from sacrifice. But it's all talking about those different dimensions are different ways of understanding what Christ did, which is he saved us in every way possible. So sacrifice is just one of those uh, component dimensions. This is the perfect concluding question because I can say <laughs> that's what we'll begin lecture three with <laughs> after lunch. <laughs>